Textures. Today's guest is Alvaro Prieto. Hello, Alvaro. Hello. Oh, Alvaro is a great friend of mine, ours, uh, awesome person, uh, good on road trip, and also an amazing firmware engineer and electrical engineer. You are doing lots of cool stuff. Hello, Alvaro. Hello. Thank you. That was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are you up to lately? Just like broadly on your projects. Oh. Um, so... We've all had a very long year, years uh, recently. Um, and actually, I quit my job last March, like 2020, Ooh. to go traveling. So that didn't work out. So then I took <laughs> some time to work on some personal projects for a bit. Um, so I've been working on personal projects. And, and then I ended up getting a job like in August. And then I've been working, but kind of doing personal stuff on the side. Um, so, yeah. so you've been building cheese things? Well, so, yeah, I've been doing. Uh, so I like cheese. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone that knows me even a little bit, um, especially you. So I like cheese and I've been making cheese now for a few years, but it's kind of the cheese making is taking a overdrive this, this particular year. So I've been making like a batch of brie every month at least. And I also make hardware to facilitate the making of said cheese. Uh, that's been one of my, my projects. What, what is this project like then? Uh, well, it all started, uh, let me see, I have, uh, it, it started many, many years ago, I think in 2016, 17, um, I, I was talking to my friend, we're like, oh, let's make some cheese, but it's kind of like in the background, so I, was, I got a little fridge, and we're going to control the temperature, the humidity, um, I had uh, like misters to spray water, I had humidity sensors, and then I drilled holes in the fridge to put the pipes through. And then I drilled another hole and I went right through the coolant line. And I, I was going to say, how do you know you're not? <laughs> uh, well, the first one was lucky. I just went through. Everything was fine. So yeah, don't <laughs> drill holes through your fridge's top, people. Uh, go through the door that doesn't have any coolant, if you must. And now I just kind of would put the sensors through just the door. Uh, but then, yeah, so I started like that. And as with most of my projects, there are excuses to learn something new. So I was like, okay, I want to learn about temperature and humidity sensors. So I'm going to make a, the excuses that she's making. And I started doing that, but it kind of got stag like stagnant. I wasn't making progress. But then a friend of mine said, hey, uh, Saturday, you got to be at Emeryville, this place nearby at like 2 p.m. or whatever. Just got to be there. And I was like, okay. And then I showed up, it was like sketchy brick building, go inside and it was a brie making class. So I went home with a little baby brie ah! that I had each in a fridge. So I had to get my fridge working in like a day. Uh, and so I did. And then over the years, I've been making progress uh, on, on the kind of different revisions, making it smaller, uh, making wireless. So now it's Bluetooth and, and I'll show you some. I have my little, um, I don't know if you can see this, little shadow Beautiful. box while well, you can see yourself but i'll tilt it up because i know everyone wants to see alex but uh so this is kind of where it started it was like a big breakout board with like lots of connectors and it had lots of wires going out and then i wanted to make it a little bit smaller because i didn't know like i had fan drivers i had all sorts of stuff but then i realized i don't need so much and then i, I need even less and then somebody i think it was wendell from evil math scientist labs it's like hey wouldn't it be cool if it was cheese shaped uh, so I was like, yeah, it would. So then <laughs> I started going uh, a little more cheese, cheese wedge shaped um, circuit boards. I have an Oshpark flex circuit, like the, the, the first flex PCB they, they, they had. Uh, I, I wanted to learn how to solder like QFN parts, um, that kind of thing, right? So, and then, yeah, these are some of my other projects that, you know, from the past, but I, I thought it'd be cool to, since Oshpark always, um, gives you three copies of every board. I always have spares. And I thought it'd be cool to <laughs> make a shadow box out of them. Uh, but the conclusion is that now I have this. So this is the kind of the conclusion. This is my cheese shaped temperature humidity sensor uh, that's Bluetooth that I put in my uh, cheese fridge or my aging containers to keep track of my cheese. Amazing. What do you call them? So this board is called Ostur. Um, o S T U R. Pretty. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's Ostur. And that just means cheese in Icelandic. Um, I have this very creative process of naming things because naming things is hard. 
where I put the name of exactly what it is or something very similar into Google Translate. And then I just click through the languages until a cool name shows up <laughs> and I just take it. So that's uh, completely have, valid. So it's just Astor. Um, I don't have, like, I have it on GitHub, uh, but it's not like very nicely written up, but all the code and file, like all my projects are open hardware and open source. I just haven't described it very well, but I did give a talk at cross supply teardown at some point in the past. One of the teardowns that happened, uh, I, I, I have a video in my website somewhere um, about the process. It's mostly about all the mistakes I made learning uh, to make this like, uh, all of my boards, you can see all the bodges I had to do and all the mistakes I made. Uh, so if you want to learn what not to do, check out that video <laughs> and I will tell you all of the mistakes I made. And then all wow. these things I tell you not to make, I make those mistakes again in future projects. And then I'm like, oh, I should have read like my own notes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, there's a, this rainy, Ooh. this is actually about your oh, this weather is station. This is so, different. So, yeah, the, the year before that, I did the cheese, the cheese cave. Uh, you also got oh. this is the way. <laughs> you haven't been done them. These people are super cool. Yes. Uh, so if people want to hear more, presumably if they want to hear more about the cheese stuff, you can go check out this. A little, out little this. bit about cheese, a little bit about like uh, a lot. Yeah, oh, I, I have a podcast, I guess. Yeah. The yes. Other reverse engineering podcast. Thank you for <laughs> breaking that up because I never do. And then my co-host Jen always is like, "You're the worst marketing person ever." Uh, which is true. <laughs> I, yeah, so you have this amazing podcast. Tell us about uh, what your deal is with this podcast. What kind of people you interview? Uh, what kind of things you delve into? Is it all about hardware reverse engineering? Or no? Like if you go to episodes, I can like tell you about some of the ones uh, we've had. Um, we we do have some hardware, uh, mostly because my co-host Jen uh, Castillo uh, and I are firmer engineers mostly right so that's kind of what we know but we like to talk to other experts like you know natalie Silvanovich. she's a google project zero she's super super talented um like reverse Whoa. engineering hardware hacker and software she reverse engineers tamagotchis and also oh. adobe flash she probably has a record person. for the most um adobe flash like vulnerabilities like found. No um because she's, she's she's brilliant um so we uh, what I would like to say is we talk to people that are much smarter than ourselves um, about things they know about. And then we ask them all the questions that the audience might want to know. You're probably in one of these, actually. We probably got you at a Supercon and asked I you. I feel like you did. Yeah, but we, we, we <laughs> talked to people about. One of these ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, one of those. Uh, about reverse engineering, satellite, satellite internet protocols, um, about uh, reverse engineering tools. Yeah, we, we, we just like to talk to people about a lot of tools because I, uh, I like to know that a tool exists because a lot of people sometimes will have a problem and they don't even know that a particular tool will solve that problem for them exists or that they can search for it. So I love inter talking to people and asking them, what are your favorite tools? What tools do you use for doing this and that? And then, well, you might not learn everything, at least you might in the back of your head next time you have an issue, it's like, oh, I heard there's a tool that does this, or I know about this tool. Let me learn more about it. I think you did this to me once at uh, Hardware.io, Hardware Security Conference, and I was doing a CTF. That's right. Yes. yes. And I had to pull the like compiled Arduino code hex file or something off of an Arduino yeah. chip. Yeah, you did that pretty I well with that one, didn't you? Yeah, but I was sitting there for half an hour trying to figure out how to decompile this thing. And I was like, this has to be something. And you walked up and you're like, Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, you've tried this one command strings. that's already built into your computer. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. yeah, strings. I think you wanted to get a string out of a binary. Uh, and then you just type strings in the, in the binary file, and it will print out any strings that it finds, including the flag. It was amazing. And it, yeah, and it absolutely got me through that challenge. So props. Yeah, and I remember that. <laughs> it totally works. You're like the tool genius. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, more on you specifically, you also sent me uh, links to this chalk project, which we sort of hinted at a moment ago, your yes. weather station project. Let's uh, have a look at that. What, tell us about it. So chalk, um, as with my other naming things, that's actually a Mayan for, it's like the Mayan version of Thor, yeah. like the god of rain and thunder, um, like the, from the Mayan civilization. 
So I just appropriated the name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and because it's cool. And well, actually, there's a little more specific than that. This started as a, a birthday present to my dad, uh, like three years ago, I think. And my dad lives in Merida in the Yucatan, uh, near Chichen Itza and all the like kind of where, where the Mayans used to be, or well, oh, they're still cool. there technically. Um, and my dad is a nerd like me and like ever, my, well, like I said in Embedded FM and my dad's a nerd and his dad was a nerd and his dad was a nerd, kind of going back. And so I decided it'd be cool to make him a weather station so he could measure all the things because we love measuring things in the family. And uh, so that's kind of how it started. But at first, if you scroll up the very top image, I, tr I, was, I, saw, I saw some project somebody did, and it was like a Raspberry Pi and Arduino, all these wires. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is mm. too complicated. Like, I, I can make it smaller, low power, all integrated. So I started trying to do that. And I just failed. Like, I, I didn't get a lot of momentum. There's a lot of issues. And I just kind of gave up on the project. And then like months or like a year later almost uh if you go down a bit i was just like okay you know what screw my pride yes <laughs> i'm an engineer but i'm gonna get something working first no matter how bulky and ridiculous it is so so i, so I think there's a picture of the big is this uh, the guy the big first enclosure yeah so, so I oh yeah the first enclosure here we go so now this looks just like the thing that i was making fun of did right <laughs> it's like this very large um like that battery is ridiculously large. I, I got a development board and then I got like, um, um, what this do you call huge, it? These huge screw terminals and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just, it's like a solar, a is that, massive is solar that panels. No, no, it's just, it's just a terminal box. And then oh. that's a solar charger. And I had a solar panel that was like ridiculously oh. oversized, um, it, it, but, but it worked. So I was like, I'm just gonna get something working. And then once I have something working, I'm gonna start optimizing. And that's kind of how the project started. And, and again, this is an excuse to learn about all these things. So I'm learning about mm. step drill bits, mm. about weatherproof enclosures, about, about weatherproof sensors, about uh, this one, I put GPS on it because why not? Um, yeah. <laughs> you, really you got it. the STM32 Nucleo on there? Yeah, exactly. What did um, that give you? I had a, I just wanted a lot of UARTs because the XB radio had a UART and then the GPS mm. had a UART. And I think something else had a UART. Uh, well, like the debug UART. <laughs> UART uh, for everyone. Yeah, so I started like that. Then I kind of integrated it all together uh, on this next board, I think, which is no longer a breakout board. And it has like mm. a little solar charge. And again, I, I kind of swiped the, the um, solar charger circuit from Adafruit. And then <laughs> I took some of the SCM32 circuit from the dev board. And now it's a smaller one, right? Mm. And again, I'm just using the XBs. Yes, they're expensive, but they work. Um, so again, I just wanted to get something working, right? Yeah. And then you'll see those, those two kind of phone cables in the bottom, those connect mm. to the anemometer, the wind speed and direction and the rain sensor, which you can see down below. Cool. Um, that, yeah, this is my backyard. You know, I didn't wow. have a view of the sky or anything or like a clear view, but you know, I, I, I got that up and running and it kind of evolved like that. I, I, I started making it smaller, lower power, more integrated. And eventually I was able to fly down to Mexico and for my dad's birth, oh, I learned about conformal coding. Mm. Um, and, 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 and then I installed it, we installed it in my dad's houses in his roof in Mexico. That's so cool. And then this, so this would transmit with XB over to a Raspberry Pi inside. Then the Raspberry Pi would save the data locally and then had a little web UI. But then I also have a server that's outside, like the public internet that can also kind of relay it. That way, you know, you don't have to be at home to see the data, but the data is not in the cloud because I hate the cloud because <laughs> I like to know where my data is. Nice, yeah. So, so that's how to, how it started. And I'll show you here. I have a few generations. The, so these are the ones that, that like it started with the breakouts, it's like one, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. Then there's like 2.0 over here. Uh, this one had two different radios because I wanted to play with that. This one I wanted to learn about four layer PCBs and different RF connectors and two sided uh, surface mount. Like this, uh, this can come off, let's see. Um, so, so I, I wanted to learn how to do my own reflow uh, two-sided. 
Um, then I integrated, I switched to Bluetooth, then I switched to LoRa, and then I was trying to make, I switched different sensors. I wanted to do my own antennas. So, <laughs> and I'm not showing you all the 3D printing stuff that I've been doing like uh, with that. Oh, and here, if you look at my little uh, workbench, there is my, one of my test setups over here with the, um, the wind speed. And I just kind of- Oh yeah. It. Um, here's the, the rain gauge. Yeah. So I, I, I don't have a window that goes to the outside. So I have to simulate my own wind and, and rain for testing. How do you do that? Do you just blow on it? Or I have a, I have a fan. <laughs> I put a little fan and a, but yeah, you can just blow on it too. Um, yeah. That's solid. Speaking of generations, you said that you made this for your father and uh, you yourself are a ham radio enthusiast. You have your own call sign. I uh, in fact, we took, we took our test at the same That's right. We studied day. together. We crammed in that hallway. Yeah. Uh, we passed at DEF CON. Yeah. It was so good. And uh, you're not the first ham radio person in your family either. No. Um, I think <laughs> the last ham radio person in my family I, was probably my great grandfather. I don't think my dad ever did it. And my grandpa maybe did it, but I don't know if he did. But my great grandpa was the first ham radio operator in Mexico. So his call sign was X1AA. And he also founded like the ham radio, I don't know, society or whatever in Mexico back in the 30s, I think. Um, this is so cool. Yeah. So so this this was- Their magazine is called Shortwave. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so my, my great grandpa, was one of the, like the first head of this thing in, in long, long time ago. I wonder yeah. if I have a history on their on the website, but oh, yeah. yeah. Do you have plans for any um, radio related projects of your own hardware? I, I got, well, I've been trying to tune these damn antennas and like, it's hard. <laughs> so I got, I got a VNA, like a little nano VNA. I don't know if you've played with it. Uh, let me grab it. But but basically, yeah, you, you could do these antennas, but the layout of the antenna is only half the battle because you got to match the impedance. So the kind of the reflect, like all these things have to, to be just right so that most of the energy goes out, the antenna doesn't get reflected back to the radio. So you have to tune, like put some inductors and some capacitors to, to tune the antenna just right so that it's most efficient. Uh, and for that, I have this, this is a very cheap VNA, a vector network analyzer. It's called a nano VNA. Cool. And it's like super cheap. It's like 50 bucks or less than a hundred bucks. Um, of course, you know, if, if you wanted to do this professionally, you'd probably be spending a few grand on some like PSI stuff and you have little calibration stuff. But yeah, you plug this in to your uh, circuit board and I have some, ah, I got stuck here. Um, I was trying to figure out how to do that. And I, I was like soldering straight to the, you know, this, this circuit board is kind of empty, but then I connect the kind of just a coax cable to where the antenna feed is. And then I kind of do measurements um, and stuff like that. And so, so I've been kind of learning to do that. That's been my main <laughs> radio enthusiast. That's super so. cool. So you also have this project uh, that you also made sort of based on something from your dad. Oh <laughs> yes. Tell us about uh, this. So uh, I have I have here. I'll show you the, the original documents. But uh, my dad also studied electrical engineer a long time ago, long time ago, and probably forty years ago. But um, he I don't know why I ended up with this uh, schematic of sorts. It's probably upside down, but it's basically a schematic for a digital clock. Um, and it's, it's big and I have pictures of it online. And with the schematic came a lab report in Spanish here that um, I have a copy of, like, like literally a photocopy, it's like recycled paper, but it's like his little lab report. It's got all these nice diagrams and fancy handwriting. Um, and, and, and all it was was a digital clock using TTL logic, I think. And just using logic IC, so you have some counters, some dividers, uh, an LED display, drivers and stuff. So during, after I quit my job and I was stuck at home during the pandemic, I 
thought it'd be cool to recreate this on a breadboard because I had most of the components. And so I have a huge Twitter thread when I'm like posting pictures and I start building this kind of clock circuit on Twitter kind of in a thread and posting like, this is what this does. Yeah. This uh, is so cool. This is what that does. And, and so it kind of started like that, which is fun. And I got, I got a lot of interactions. Like people really liked it. A lot of memories, that kind of thing. And because of that, I thought, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if I built like an actual circuit board out of this, like make a soldering kit for my dad and then make him solder it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was her father's day last year. I built, I designed a circuit board and, and I have the picture, well, I have the actual circuit boards here um, using his schematics mostly and then made it. And then I did Osh Park after dark. So you can see the, Ooh, the traces. Oh yeah, and, that's good And stuff. I made this uh, circuit board a soldering kit and I mailed it to my dad, um, you know, cause you know, I haven't seen my parents since a long time ago. Uh, so, but, but I, you know, I mailed him some, some gizmos uh, to, to, to play with. And yeah, so, so it uses a five, five type timer that a lot of people are familiar with to as a, as a clock. And it does like a one kilohertz signal and then it has dividers to get it down to a one second signal. Wow. But five, five, five timers are extremely like, not quite precise with the timing, like the temperature goes up or down, the frequency changes. So it's not the best for a clock. Oh no. So I put also a, a crystal oscillator, like you can select, do you want to do the old school, like really bad timing way or like a, an actual clock. Um, so, 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 so I did, I did that and, and, and I can show you the, the clocks I have here as well. Please. So the very first one I did, you know, you can see after dark, uh, but you can also see that I had screwed up a lot of things. And then I was in a hurry because it was Father's Day coming out. So I did a local uh, Bay Area circuits, I think. No solder mask, <laughs> just, it's just copper. And, uh, and again, I screwed it up. And then finally, 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 I got the final, the other one was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> that okay. is gorgeous. Open source hard. Yeah, I know, it looks kind of cool. So, so yeah, I mailed it to my dad and with all the components and he was able to put his own together and, and now he has a little clock that he designed uh, with his little lab partner. I have, um, I have the names there probably. And yeah, and actually somebody online ordered the components and built their own, which is really cool. Oh, that's uh, awesome, like that's the best. Somebody on Twitter saw it and they just ordered, because with Oshpark you can just publish your, uh, your design and anyone can order it. And somebody actually put it together, which I thought was super cool. Like somebody That's I don't so... know. Ooh. Yeah, I and... got like a nice photo of everything. Oh, that's um, lovely. I think I have scans of all that stuff. And yeah, Oshpark Shared Project, there you go. Here we go. Yeah, it's not the cheapest because it's a pretty big board, but yeah. you know. Whatever. And you're getting three of them. Yeah. And, and if you really can't afford it, like the, you can make your own Gerbers with the, um, I don't know if I, I might've published the Gerbers, but if not, like the KiCat files are there and you can, um, and I found a USB connector that's through hole, a USB uh, mini, which was very hard to find. Huh. I want it to be all hand solderable. Yeah, yeah, see, there's the Gerbers. Look, I actually did it right. Nice. <laughs> actually. Open source schematic. hardware. <laughs> uh -huh. Truly open source. Yeah, I love I love open source stuff. It's just it definitely takes effort to you know properly document and publish everything. But um, I do my best. This is beautiful. Thank you. Oh, it's even got all the LED drivers in it. Oh yeah, I wanted to label it. Yeah, you have your clock divider. So if you like, you know, measure the signals here, you'll get a one kilohertz wave or a, a hundred hertz. Or, you yeah. get bonus points for like act like bonus open source points for uh, commenting your <laughs> your board. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that, that was the whole point of this one. It's it's kind of a it used to be a school project, so it's got the educational vibes, right? Like, oh, and and, I, and, and yeah, they got they got a thousand out of, out of a thousand in the in the lab report over here. So so they did good. They passed. Um, yeah, no, like they had how all different things work and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, it was a cool like, and I, I honestly, I'd never used logic gates very much before, like you know, old school um, uh, TTL logic circuits, because uh, you know we're from the age of the microcontroller, and it's so much easier to use a microcontroller. 
this is really cool to me actually um one of the things that uh one of the only things that i have left from my dad is a a folder full of uh circuit diagrams that i don't know if he designed them or he pulled i think he pulled some of them out of various ancient magazines yeah and uh he's just got all these beautiful hand-drawn ones and i've been wanting to turn them into pcbs and like it's a little weird because i don't know if like he created the circuits or if it's like you know popular mechanics is going to come after me after 50 (laughs) years or something but like uh, that'd be a cool story either way yeah, it's very inspiring, <laughs> and I, I feel like I've got to do it now. Oh, yeah, it's great practice, you know. Like if you, if you want to practice SkyCAD, like nothing better than have a schematic ready to go and just like transcribe it and then make your board. One uh, thing about it is that it uses some ancient components. So one of the ones is a chromatic key, like uh, audio keyboard, and um, it uses these transistors that are like super. Like they don't really make them anymore, but I think they sell some, you can find them because some old cars used them. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you can still get those around. Well, I, I will tell you uh, that we know all the people that would know where to get these components. Uh, the, you know, Tube Time US on Twitter. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, Eric, he, he knows all the people and he knows where to get all the things. So, so if, if you do struggle with that, we'll just post it on Twitter and they have like secret IRC chats of ancient computer clubs and whatnot. Yeah. If they still can have the, I mean, they have, better not be on Freenode. Oh, no, they all moved to the other one. Oh. Uh. Chat or whatever. Yeah, no, no, no. I think people moved out of there. That was, mm. yeah. I didn't so, follow up with that. Yeah. <laughs> so for your cheese boards, your Worcester, uh, I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but. Uh, you were using, you were doing flex uh, PCBs and you were doing QFN soldering. All these projects, you're like, oh yeah, I wanted to try out making my own antenna. I wanted to yeah. try out doing this stuff. Do you have any tips for people making flex circuits or doing uh, soldering QFN? Um, so the flex, I, I don't really have that much experience, but Oshpark has really cheap flex prototyping service. So just just make some, try them out. Um, there, there's also a lot of uh, application notes from various uh, like PCB fabs or, or just manufacturers. So if, if you just search online and they have tons of recommendations, you know, like trace widths or designs, all that stuff. And for, for, for QFN, I would just say go nuts and use a stencil. Just start using uh, surface mount stencils and solder paste. And it was night and day. like. And I started doing that for the chuck for the weather station boards, or no, or for the cheese board. I forget one of these projects. I decided, oh, I'm gonna start making my, like because um, I was soldering by hand everything. And let me get some stencils over here. But then I realized that there's a lot of like Osh Park, and now there's also Osh Stencil, which is it's a separate company, but they do kind of integrate. So when you order your Osh Park boards, there's a link at the bottom saying, hey, do you want to order some stencils? And Yes, you can. Oh. You, you can get really cheap capped on ones. Um, I don't know if you can see that there's like holes through there. Um, and then, but if you do anything small, I'd still highly recommend just go with stainless steel. And you can see that here. And so, so this is probably like 10, 15 bucks. And it, it, it pays for itself in the time you save. So you kind of just fixture that in. You put some solder paste with a squeegee. Um, if, you, if you want to see what that looks like, check out uh, Greg Davil's Twitter or Instagram. He's he's a he's a master of the surface mount. Well, he's the, everything electronics. He's the he's the best at basically. Um, he's got like super macro shots of solder paste. It's beautiful. And, oh yeah, those little macro yeah. videos of solder paste melting amazing uh, like yeah. anyone who posts those it's just, oh, I can yeah no work. it's just and I, I can never get it just right but but I, I would say it's not as scary as you think like it's actually i think it's easier to do solder paste because then you just put the components on um and then you can heat it in like if you have a hot surface be it like an old skillet or or uh, whatever flat surface it gets hot you can also just hit it with a hot air gun if it's a small board you can just literally manually reflow the whole thing or you could do a little toaster oven or uh, infrared reflow oven. Like I have a infrared reflow oven from China that was like, I don't know, 150 bucks maybe. And it works pretty well. And that really changed the game for me. Cause now I, I'm not afraid of using tiny, like 
tiny components because I just use a stencil. And then for another project, for this other project I have, I actually used the tiniest, tiniest BGA you could ever imagine. It's a two by two. You, you won't be able to see it. Um, it's there. Oh my word. It's like 0.7 millimeters by 0.7 millimeters or something. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but it's tiny, right? The, the, the pitch on the BGA is 0.35 millimeters, um, which before I would have been like, no way I can do that. But now I literally, actually Ben Krasnow taught me this when I used to work with him. He, he's just like, just don't worry about the solder paste. Just get your BGA, put a bunch of blocks between it, that and the board and just hit it with some heat. And then it just like whoosh, snaps into place. She's like, what? Amazing. It, it's magic. And um, yeah. So the one challenge I've had that I could imagine coming up with that is that if I'm not careful with the heat gun, then I'll just like blow the components. Yeah, I'll always turn the, the, turn the air speed like way down um, and just have heat in the like low air. Like I usually go like one to two out of 10 on my, on the speed setting on my hotter. Cause yeah, the components are going to blow away. And, and similar to that, uh, QFNs are actually, in my mind, harder to solder than BGAs and that um, like TSSOP, like the ones that have like the legs. In my mind, QFNs are harder, uh, especially if- It makes sense because we're talking about quad flat, no lead ones, right? Where yeah, the exactly. legs don't even, or the, the pads don't even necessarily extend like to the yeah, sides of the, just like inside. the sides of the thing. It, sometimes it's just on the bottom. Yeah, so you can see here I have two QFNs, right? Uh -huh. And depending on the pitch, so the spacing between the legs, you might be able, if this is wide enough, to have solder mask between each leg. And then everything's easy. But for example, this one, um, it, it's, it's, too, like, it's too short. So, so the, the minimum solder mask thickness on Oshpark is not big enough. So, so then as soon as solder mask is completely open, all the legs together, so they can short much more easily. Um, but you know, like you just learn, you can just also hit it later with the, with the um, solder wick and like remove some of the extra solder, but still I wouldn't, I would have never dreamed of trying uh, QFNs just hand soldering it because they have that middle bottom pad that I did do one where I came at it from below. I think, uh, tube time, Eric, uh, Schlepper, um, gave me the tip. It's just like, put a, like a big via under the, the main pad and you can like hit it with solder from below and melt the, the, the main little pad. Um, he's also a, a trove of useful tips and tricks. And, and if, you haven't, if, if anyone for some reason doesn't know about Tube Time US on Twitter, he's got the coolest um, like threads and everything from how does this component work to why is California on fire? Uh, <laughs> and he cuts a lot of stuff in half. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot. Very good. <laughs> what does an LED look halfway through? Like, there we go. So, uh, you said that you worked with Ben Krasnow. Where, where were you working and what was that like? Oh, that was at Barely, like Barely Life Sciences. So it was, used to be Google Life Sciences. Um, so it's kind of a medical device company. And so I, I, got, to, I got to go to his lab and learn a few tricks. Ooh, yeah. any other secrets you can share? Um, another really useful one he showed me was to reflow really tiny boards, which when you're doing medical devices, you have to do, is um, uh, he found these really small, like little square ceramic tiles that, that have two wires coming out of them. And then you put like current through them. And then they're like these little tiny heaters. And, and they might be like this big. So you put that on some sort of like fireproof surface or just heat proof surface. And then you have these little tiny tiles, but then you just plug it into your power supply, hit it with like a couple of amps or an amp and then it warms up super fast. And for reflowing little boards, like, you know, this size, it's perfect. Cause you don't have to heat up like a big surface. It's just like small. And, and, and it's, you know, most of my boards that are like this size are perfect to reflow in a little tiny cube or a square. Um, so, so that, that one was super, super useful. I need to, I need to buy some of those tiles because I don't have, I don't have them here at home. 
Yeah, I think Adafruit started selling a little heater that's about that big, a tiny hot plate. And I wonder if it's based on the same thing. Maybe it's like it that be. inside. Yeah, but I just, it, it, I was surprised in it and it worked, it worked very well. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell us about the work you're doing at So Far Ocean. So Far Ocean, yeah. So I got a new job last August. And we're working on, uh, well, I'm personally working on firmware for remote ocean, remote sensing ocean buoys. So they, they're they like basketball sized buoys with solar panels on them. And they're mostly measuring wave heights and wind speeds and directions, and also the wave directions, as well as the sea surface temperature, uh, amongst other things. And what this gives us woo, is- It's all very this pretty. Yeah, it's really good data about ocean weather, but like everywhere. So, so we have, I don't know, I think there's a map somewhere of where the buoys are, but we basically have sensors in all over the place and it lets us augment the weather forecasts that are publicly available. So, so NOAA publishes like, I think every six hours or so, um, global weather forecasts. And those are pretty good. Oh, there you go. It's like, Whoa. I think that's an estimate. That I don't know if that's legit what they are, but that's kind of what it looks like. So we're able to augment the forecast because we have actual measurements in all these different places, right? That uh, you can do some satellite measurements, but the wave heights, you might be have resolutions of kilometers or more, whereas like we know exactly where all these things are. So with that, we can do much better forecasts and you know people like to buy that data. Uh, so we sell the, the devices themselves to scientists that, that want to do studies. Like there's a company called Aqualink, I think, that's doing coral reef uh, temperature monitoring across like various coral reefs around the world. Scientists can buy them. We also have the all drifting, the drifter buoys that are just all over the ocean. And we sell Ooh. that data. And then we have a ship, uh, ship routing service, which is like, we have all these cool weather forecasts. So if you have a cargo ship going from one place to the world to the other, we can tell you like, hey, go around this because there's like higher waves and they're going to slow you down and you're going to waste a lot of fuel. Or like, hey, there's a current here that you can catch and go faster, like all that stuff. It's like a Google Maps routing. I don't know. <laughs> so I work on firmware for buoys. That's really cool. Are there any special considerations for building firmware? I, obviously, a lot of this is probably under NDA. But uh, yeah, is there anything different about building stuff for buoys compared to on land? Well, uh, I'll tell you, we can't do remote firmware updates because <laughs> satellite and inter internet is expensive. So that makes sense. all of these boosts are using Iridium uh, satellites right now to send kind of information back, but you basically get charged by like the byte. Like it's not cheap. Um, and also these buoys that are drifting, you're never gonna see it again. So if there's some sort of bug and like you can't recover, you'll never be able to reproduce it because it's gone, right? Like wow. imagine in the middle of the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's no way you're ever going to see this buoy again because it's like out there somewhere. You're so, not going to like send a ship to go retrieve this one. Yeah, it'd be too expensive, right? Like it'd be very tricky and also ridiculously expensive. So uh, you know, we test stuff locally. Like we have some kind of uh, moored outside of like San Francisco, but those are kind of tied to one place and they kind of behave a little bit different. But but yeah, like, you know, there's that. There's the whole mechanicals of like salt water wants to corrode everything you can imagine and there's also all those critters that live in the water that just attach to everything and start growing up your solar panels um that's amazing so there's a lot of cool like a lot of technical issues to, to, to solve and then for firmware yeah like you, you want to make sure that the thing works because you're going to send it out and never see it again and hopefully you'll hear from it for a long time but you know what you send out is that's it i feel like a lot of us uh firmware and software engineers are, are spoiled where we can just always still, let's just do firmware update after the fact. Uh, we can't do that. <laughs> not not uh, cost effectively, I guess. Yeah, uh, I'm curious, do you have any uh, kind of a management system in uh, place for like managing so that it doesn't just like litter the sea with dead buoys or? Um, well, like, what do you mean? Well, like once, like, so, they don't so for example, if you, or... if you have like a drifty one, right, and you've lost yeah. contact with it or whatever, uh, is it just going to like be out there forever or? I, I don't know, <laughs> like uh, eventually, I don't know. So uh, some of them, if enough stuff grows on it, they'll sink because it's just too much stuff grew on it, right? And it got too heavy. Um, but, I, but to be honest, I don't know what happens. I don't think we know what happens to us in the middle of the ocean because we just, we just don't know. 
Uh, the ones close to the shore definitely get overrun with like wildlife. Um, and then you have to go clean them regularly. Um, otherwise, like they'll get too heavy. But I, I, I honestly don't know what happened. Yeah, like the, there is some plastic waste, of course. And, and, and that is one of the pro, like long-term projects we have is to make them more kind of environmentally friendly. But the amount of uh, emissions that we save with these cargo ships, like well more than makes up for the, you know, relatively small, small amount of plastic we're introducing, I think. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to speak for the company. That, that, that's just my personal, uh, yeah. I also love the idea of these becoming like habitats. Like sometimes, you know, they obviously yeah. clean them and stuff, but people do, you know, sink old subway cars and stuff into the ocean and they become crusted over. And the fact that they're just like doing this, they're like, human, you released this into our realm. <laughs> it is mine. ours now. We yeah. claim it. So th 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 there's both sides to this actually. And, and I'm going to go back to, I'm going to marketing Alvaro, marketing hat. Uh, and one of our reverse engineering podcast uh, interviews, I think the one about the satellite internet reverse engineering, uh, Gareth, one of our co-hosts uh, at, you know, at, at Torcam, you know, I don't know if you remember Gareth, like very, very tall uh, man from Tasmania. Um, he used to, I think he was working with, um, oh, should I forget the name, uh, the, the people that go after the whaling ships and um, like it's this organization that is against illegal fishing. Oh, is it Greenpeace or the Sea Yeah, Shepherds? I think it was Greenpeace. Um, so there is a lot of illegal fishing that will use similar technology to ours. Like imagine if you put it like a big flat thing in the middle of the ocean, becomes a habitat, small fish hang out underneath, then big fish come to eat the smaller fish. And then you basically, and then you could have like a sensor underneath to tell you where there's tuna or other large fish. And then the illegal, illegal fishing vessels would come and get them, right? So basically it's like a trap for, for like large fish that they're not supposed to be fishing, but they set these traps with satellite internet and GPS and stuff. So they were able to use, if I, if I remember correctly, they were able to listen in on the transmissions because they reverse engineered the satellite protocol and they were able to find these and take them out uh, before the illegal fishing people could do it. Uh, but there are definitely malicious uses for similar things. That is so cool! Hacking yeah. the satellites to defeat poachers or whatever. That's so cool. Yeah. Wait, which one was that? Do you know? I think it's uh, it's not magic. I think it's episode 13. I, if you look at the show notes, maybe we'll mention it. Um, these are really um, good show notes. Brain traffic. Maybe. Maybe we Gareth mentioned these one. tools. Yeah, he was definitely... Yeah, yeah. So Wire it's shark. It's oh yeah, yeah. No, like th that's one of the questions we love to ask our guests. Like, hey, what's one of your one, one tool that you would that, that you use regularly that you know you would like people to know about and stuff? Um, yeah, like so I have cool. the tools tab in the left, but I haven't updated it in a long time. Uh, oh, or, uh, yeah, it's Ooh. way out of date. But the, the 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 original idea was like, hey, all the tools we talk in the episodes, we should pull them here, and then we'll link to the episode. Uh, but that's a lot of work, so I just kind of like you gotta put strings on here. <laughs> hasn't, yeah, it hasn't been updated in like a couple of years. This is so cool. Oh man, uh, I think I've reached the end of my questions. I prefer prepared for grilling you, but is there anything you'd like to throw in there before we wrap up here? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll reiterate some of the stuff that, that I mentioned before. Like, if you're working on a project, don't suffer from premature optimization like I have in the past. It is a common issue. And just get something working, right? And I think I've said this in other podcasts um, where don't worry if it's not elegant, if there's like hacky and there's wires everywhere. That's fine as long as you get it working. Like, I see so many awesome projects that, you know, you can be with your like, uh, annoying engineering had like, ooh, I could do that better, but like, but you don't. Like, they're doing it, and you're not, right? Um, and, and I've I've suffered from that in the past. Where like, oh, I'm gonna optimize, like, oh, I know what I'm doing, and then I just never finish. Um, versus all these other really cool projects, like using an Arduino. Like I scoffed at that back in the day because I'm like, oh, I'm a real firm engineer, you know, like I know how to write code, uh, whatever. And then I just didn't use, but but then you pick up an Arduino and you can get things done so fast. And most of the time that's good enough. Like don't let good, like, what's it? I, there's a, there's a saying of like, don't let perfect. Perfect is the enemy. enemy of good or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that one. Um, yeah. And, 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 and like, you see all these different, like, 
these are all mistakes I made and I learned from sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, like it takes forever, but I've learned so much and, and I've enjoyed kind of, well, there's been a lot of frustration, but I've learned a lot. And, and literally a lot of this stuff has gotten me jobs. Like this is my hobby, but you know, when I'm at a job and then people see, oh, you make circuit boards too. Like what do you want to work on circuit boards for work? I'm like, sure, yeah, why not? And, and at so far, <laughs> at so far ocean, I, part of the interview process, one of the things I really like is you have to give a presentation to the whole team or the whole company. Uh, Cause it's a very small company about anything you're passionate about. And that's the only prompt they give you. Like they don't tell you, is this technical, not technical, they just say, so my talk was, I gave like a five minute, how do you make cheese presentation? And then I talked about my cheese monitoring and my weather station. And guess what? This company makes kind of weather stations in the ocean. So it was a very relevant experience. Nothing that I've done for work before, but it was personal projects that helped me kind of get this, uh, my real engineer job. Legit. Oh, that's such good advice. Same. I was working in tech support for years and I like was doing this stuff and publishing it on the side. And now I like, eh, oh, you, you got know. the coolest job. Yeah. <laughs> it is the best job, but your stuff, I get to hang out with cool people like you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is so cool. And uh, obviously join us again anytime you like, especially if you have more cool stuff to share. Everyone will post the links in the description below for all the cool stuff Oliver shared, including links to your social media and your GitHub and stuff. Thank you so much for joining us and have an awesome rest of your night. Thank you.